Um, so we are very happy to receive Professor Hugo Pagalo at the Global Law Program at uh, Fundação Getúlio Vargas this week. Professor uh, Pagalo is a professor of juris jurisprudence at the University of Torino in Italy. He has been working extensively with um, technology, law and technology, um, philosophy for the last uh, couple of years, doing some um, pretty amazing work with the European Commission, Commission for IT law. Um, so we're going to have a short conversation. Professor Ugo, thank you so much. For Pleasure of mine to be here with you in Sao Paulo again. Wonderful. So um, I'd like to start with a more general question. Um, it is a fact that technology affects our everyday lives. Um, but the new frontiers of um, how technology will impact the way the legal profession um, happens nowadays, that's still a little bit blurred. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Good point. <laughs> and, uh, and in fact, I think that uh, uh, first uh, we are uh, only uh, at the beginning of a major uh, revolution, technological revolution, and let's call it the information revolution. That is uh, that for the first time ever, human societies uh, depend on uh, information as uh, their vital resource. Uh, and uh, uh, this huge transformation is uh, impacting uh, all aspects of uh, human society and of course the law uh, as well. Uh, uh, there are many ways in which uh, we uh, may illustrate uh, this uh, very impact. Uh, uh, consider, for example, the uh, cognitive aspects of this uh, revolution. Uh, for example, uh, just a, a short autobiographical remark. Uh, when I graduated, uh, I don't want to say last century, last millennia. <laughs> uh, well, I could have needed uh, one day to find out uh, 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 a sentence, a law, and the like. Uh, and nowadays, uh, maybe new generations uh, do not pay attention to that. But uh, in less than the one second, uh, they will find out uh, what uh, uh, the lawyers needed one day to find out. Uh, but think, uh, for example, about uh, how technology has produced uh, new set, sets of uh, legal issues, from uh, computer crimes uh, to uh, uh, cyber warfare, or how all the legal fields ha uh, have been transformed by this uh, revolution. Uh, copyright into digital copyright, which is a different, completely different thing. Inf uh, privacy uh, into data protection and so on and so forth. Um, not to talk about legal uh, automation, so that uh, the normative uh, side of the law, if A then should be uh, this uh, specific sanction, is blurring. Uh, in, uh, in becoming a matter of uh, engineering. Um, stop me when <laughs> you decided because I can uh, took and uh, I could talk about this uh, all this afternoon. Uh, so among the many several important things uh, uh, we should stress, one is paramount uh, and concerns how uh, an increasing number of uh, 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 sets of legal expertise will be done by machines by the end of this uh, decade. And uh, uh, the good news is that, however, this major uh, transformation will open up uh, a new set of new opportunities for the legal uh, domain. Uh, although this means uh, another huge transformation uh, concerning this time legal education, that is uh, the interdisciplinary uh, kind of skills uh, uh, lawyers uh, will need uh, in, uh, I don't want to say 
uh, in the future, but in a short time. Okay, excellent. Um, so when more than a decade ago, Steven Spielberg um, um, created the film, you know, the famous film on artificial intelligence, it seemed very, you know, a very distant future, very far-fetched. It's not that distance now, right? Artificial intelligence is here and is here to stay. Um, can you give us some concrete examples of how artificial in intelligence is, is changing the way we, um, we live or the way we interact and, and whatever? Wow, several examples. Uh, the first one could be that uh, most of the time, hard to quantify, let's say 80% of the time people are interacting on a, a network platform uh, or say, for example, uh, on eBay or uh, they are uh, uh, buying some, uh, something on uh, iTunes and the like, they are uh, interacting with uh, uh, smart machines. Uh, another example uh, could be a uh, current debate before the United Nations uh, about whether uh, uh, we should ban or not uh, autonomous level weapons. Uh, that is, again, uh, uh, artificial intelligence systems, uh, this time applies alas uh, to uh, machines uh, uh, on the battlefield. Uh, so that uh, we are full of these kinds of uh, examples. But let me add another movie then. Uh, my favorite example here is Die Hard 4. 4. Uh, why I, I, I'm uh, recalling uh, this uh, 10 years old movie, uh, maybe from 2006, 7. Anyway, just Google and uh, you will uh, find out. Because in that movie, uh, it was still a sci-fi, science fiction scenario. Uh, the very case of a cyber attack. That is, in that movie, uh, uh, an entire city was uh, paralyzed uh, by a cyber attack. Recall that uh, I stress before the fact that uh, we are at the very beginning of the information revolution, that is, society is depending on information as a vital resource. Uh, once you block the flow of information, you are paralyzing an entire country. And this is remarkable because uh, what used to be a science fiction Hollywood movie became reality a year later. The first uh, uh, cyber attack uh, was against a little country, but it was completely paralyzed. I mean Estonia in 2007. Uh, What's going on here is the fact that uh, this kind of relationship between uh, science fiction and then reality, think about uh, the uh, well-known uh, Asimov, uh, three or four laws uh, of uh, robotics, uh, needed a certain amount of time, decades, uh, before uh, becoming reality. What's going on here is that uh, the span of time is reducing, 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 and sometimes reality is anticipating science fiction movies. That's a great example. Um, I think Hollywood is a lot uh, is to blame on this perception that artificial intelligence has to do with you know human-like robots. But the truth is, artificial intelligence is present every day. When you Google something you're interacting with, uh, with an intelligent machine, right? Um, now, the last point I would like to, to ask you, Brazil is currently in the process of drafting its first data protection bill. Um, the bill draws a, a lot of um, um, uh, inspiration from the European uh, model of data protection. Um, what kind of advice would you have for Brazil in that sense? What is important? What are the important principles that one should um, care for when drafting, um, you know, a, a law so important as uh, data protection? Especially taking in cons into consideration um, the topic that we were discussing earlier—that 
um, you know, the control of information is what determines um, who has the power, right? <coughs> well, uh, the new uh, EU uh, regulation, uh, which will be effective uh, in a couple of years, uh, I mean uh, 2018, uh, is really complex. Uh, it's a uh, well, depending on the format, but let's say, just to give you an idea, almost a 100-pages document. So, uh, on the one hand, it's very difficult to compress all this legal information in a short answer. On the other hand, uh, a couple of things. The first one, uh, which I, I think deserve priority here. On uh, one hand, uh, the new uh, EU regulation still hinges on the old uh, uh, con uh, information and consent model. That is, uh, I, uh, I, let's say, uh, a private company give you the information uh, concerning why uh, I'm requesting you your personal data, the aims, uh, for which I'm uh, asking you that personal data, blah, blah, blah. And then, uh, on the basis of this in, uh, information, you'll sell, uh, tell me yes or not. Uh, most of the time, clicking yes. Uh, and uh, in my opinion, not only my opinion, uh, this is a partially failed uh, paradigm. Uh, for the simple reason that uh, it uh, uh, would need an Olympic uh, kind of mind in order to determine how to balance short-term gains with, uh, uh, I don't want to say a long period, but the, uh, mid, uh, medium period uh, risks. Uh, so that, uh, second point, uh, What's new with the uh, uh, new EU regulation, it's very interesting, concerns uh, uh, a new generation of data protection impact assessments. Uh, that is, in the same way in which before selling uh, medicines, uh, uh, generally speaking, uh, drugs uh, on pharmacies uh, to the people, you have to test them. Uh, well, by considering the speed of technological innovation, so we are back to our uh, previous topic, uh, and I'm thinking about uh, robotics, uh, I'm thinking about the Internet of Things, uh, I'm thinking about the big data, and so on and so forth. Uh, well, it would be very important, uh, before asking people's consent, to test these uh, uh, new technologies uh, in order to determine the level of risk. Uh, partially these uh, 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 approach uh, has been endorsed by the new regulation. Uh, and uh, finally, because of uh, these uh, uh, technological challenges, uh, especially I'm thinking now about uh, big data, what's going on is a shift from uh, in the traditional individual protection to uh, a new need for uh, group rights protection. In other words, uh, what's happening here is the fact that uh, there, out there, whatever, national governments, uh, uh, secret services, private companies, that's not the point. Uh. What's very interesting is the fact that they are not targeting you and me, but uh, you and me could be their target because we are part of a group, although we don't know to be part of a group. So, um, uh, just to conclude, uh, what I think it would be important, especially if you are thinking about a new data protection regulation, would be to pay attention to this new group privacy level of uh, uh, protection. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to have you here and uh, we hope we can uh, have you back pretty soon. I hope so. <laughs>